Welcome into the A-List podcast. I'm Kwani A. Lunis, the co-host with the most, I guess, with A. Sharon Blakely, the actual host of this podcast. This is the day that folks in Celtics Nation have been waiting for all season long when all that love that they've been giving Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum this year comes to fruition in the form of all-star selections. Not one of the Jays, but both Jays. Right around your left shoulder there, both Jays get into the big game. So if you're listening, you can't see this, check it out on YouTube, but I have a shrine (laughs) to the Jays right now because they both deserve it. They are both all-stars this year. Jason Tatum, obviously a second time. But Jalen Brown was snubbed last year, but he finally got in and everyone is finally acknowledging the hard work that he's been putting in. Well, the the thing about Jalen is that every year he's been in the league, he's been appreciably better the Mm -hmm. following season. And I thought last year, I thought he was on the bubble. I I think that, you know, when when the coaches were looking at that last roster spot on the all-star reserves, I think he was in the conversation. Uh, But this year, there was no conversation. I I reached out to a couple of of coaches just to get a a sense of, of who they were voting for. And they, you know, one of them had Jason and Jalen on their ballot, and the other one only had Jalen. And that's, to me, wasn't that surprising when you look at the way they played. Now, now Tatum has had, statistically speaking, a great season, one of the better seasons for guys in his draft class. But Jalen Brown has been so consistently elite this season. And to me, that's what defines an an all-star. But the the one thing that I will say that I I think is is certainly uh, something that people are going to question is whether a team that's with a 500 record should have multiple all-stars in the same year. I think that that's something that a lot of people are going to look at and just kind of scratch their heads and question whether the Celtics deserve two guys. But if you're going by what those guys did statistically, if you're going by just where they stand in a pantheon of great players in the Eastern Conference, they're all-stars. Absolutely, without a doubt. And I think to your point, if anything, it just questions, it makes people question why this team is not performing to the caliber that we've expected because they do have these stars. So I'm not sure where we go from here. Obviously they've been pulling the team and and playing to the all-star level, but we are not going to not talk about the fact that (laughs) there needs to be some work done in that Celtics roster organization, whatever the case may be to actually bring the whole team. to maybe at least a close enough all-star caliber as their stars. Well, the, the thing that, that to me that, that has to be discussed is, is Brad Stevens and just where does he fit into all this? Uh, because you've got two guys who are all-stars and they're voted on by your fellow colleagues, the oh, folks yeah. who, who spend every single day and night trying to game plan when they're playing the Celtics to limit these two guys who still go out there and get the job done. Uh, Brad Stevens, you know, there's a lot of blame pie to go around when you look at this team being 500, and he certainly deserves a good slice of that as well. Uh, But when you look at Jalen, you look at Jason, it's hard to look at them and feel as though that they are part of the issue. Uh, When you look at the way they're playing, not just the stats, but just the way they actually play the game where they're passing the ball, they're getting others involved. And again, Jalen has been consistently elite. Tatum has been over elite some nights, Ugh, others. And he had a, a stint where he wasn't playing at all. So I think that definitely could have hurt him if he didn't get in. That would probably be right. one of the bigger reasons why as well. Yeah. But I do, we're talking about the Eastern Conference. Um, all-Stars, and I do have this tweet, in honor of Black History Month. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Julius Randle is an All-Star. Bobby Schmurder is free, and fans are like, <laughs> See, this is a Knicks fan, but I just thought it was so hilarious because you, you do got to shout out Bobby Schmurder. He's out of jail. I just had to bring him, you know, I had to find an excuse to bring him on the podcast as well. <laughs> See, I'm pleasantly surprised that you even know who that is, Kwani. Who Bobby Schmurder is? Yes. Why would I not know who Bobby Schmurda is? I, We've been waiting for him to be out for so long. And I'm 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 just I'm pleasantly surprised that that you knew who he was. That's that's awesome. But I'm the, a well-rounded woman, all right? <laughs> yes, you are. And I'm I'm proud to know you. Thank proud you. to know you. I'm also proud to know that Julius Randle is an all-star. He was a guy, and I, I wrote about him for, for Bleach Report a few weeks ago. And the feedback I got was interesting. 
um, because I was talking about how his game has evolved to where he's in that conversation. And there were people who were like, no, why should he be? When you look at what he's doing, there are only a couple of guys in the league from a statistical standpoint that are impacting the game in terms of scoring, rebound, and passing the way he is. One of them is named LeBron James. Another one is th this guy who plays in Denver, uh, Nikola Jokic. You ever heard of him? So yeah, I think when, so. you, when your name and your game is in that elite company, you yeah. got to be an all-star. And and the other thing, too, and, and, and this is the one thing that, you know, Celtics fans need to be aware of is the Knicks are literally on their heels. Yeah. Um, the Knicks. The New yeah. York Knicks. Yeah, we're not talking about Carmelo Anthony's Knicks. We're not talking about Bill Bradley back in the day, New York Knicks. We're talking about Julius Randle's Knicks. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anyone on that list that you think should not be there, or is there anyone that you think should have been an all-star? You know what? I thought it was a toss-up between Vucevic in Orlando and Sabonis out in Indiana. I think I thought a case could be made for either one of those guys being on the team and the other one off. But, you know, again, Vucevic, I think, is having a really good season. Orlando, not so much. Uh, so I thought that might have kind of tilted the coach's sway towards, you know, Sabonis, who got in last year. But, man, um, the other guys on the list, I mean, you're talking about Ben Simmons, Tatum, James Harden, no-brainer, Zach Levine, who I, I think really – just the last couple of weeks really stepped his game up. And now with Chicago being kind of in the conversation to be a playoff team, he definitely deserved to be there. And obviously, you know, Jalen and Jason, you know, their, their body of work this season warranted them being there as well. But Savonis was the one guy that didn't get in that I think you could have made a case for him getting that spot that went to Vucevic. Mm, okay, I can see that. I'm excited to see, well, if this all-star game actually happens. I mean, <laughs> it's not an actual – Thing that people look forward to, but it's cool to see when the best of the best get together every year. So we'll see if Atlanta actually, like I said, happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And another name that I know some people are going to be kind of complaining that didn't get in was was Trey Young, who's like eighth yeah. in the league in scoring. The game is going to be now. It's going to be uh, in his backyard there in Atlanta. Yeah. But I just I, Atlanta feels as though that team was as. They're underachieving. I just don't think that they have played at the level, and I don't think he's shown the growth as a player that you need to be an also. Like, like Trey Young is still a brutally bad defender. Uh, mm -hmm. He's, in, in many respects, he's gotten worse than he was last year. And, yeah. I mean, he makes Trey – I mean, he makes a guy like Kyrie Irving look like Kawhi Leonard defensively, and that's never a good thing. So – We knew that about Trey Young. I think everyone realized that he was that offensive star that you needed, and they just need to build around him defensively. Yeah, but you know what? I still th this is the thing, and and I I've, I've talked to a couple of coaches about this in the past, and and I agree with them in that when guys are elite scorers, they're usually elite scorers because they can get to the spots they want to when they want to get there. True. The yeah. same philosophy holds the defense. If you're if you can if you know how to get to where you need to get to when you want to get there, why can't you do it at the other end of the floor? It's not <laughs> about ability; it's about desire and effort. And frankly, do you want to do it? And that to me is why Trey Young is going to be a hit or miss all-star. Uh, that team has to get better and win more games for you to feel comfortable with him being an all-star because until he shows that he wants to defend, he's going to be right on the cusp year in and year out of getting in, maybe not. And, you know, again, I, I can't roll with a cat like that. But you know who I can roll with? I can roll with Chuck Cooper the third. Yeah. Um, our guest this week on the A-List podcast, Chuck, whose father uh, was the first black drafted by the NBA, played for the Boston Celtics. And Chuck's going to feed us some knowledge, some food for thought as we close out Black History Month. Uh, here is our interview with good friend Chuck Cooper the third. Chuck Cooper, CEO, founder of the Chuck Cooper Foundation. Chuck, thank you so much for being on the A-List podcast. How are you doing today, my friend? Hey, it's a pleasure to be on the A-list. Thanks for having me on. No problem. No problem at all. Kwani Luna's our co-host with the most. And uh, I, have, I have to point out, I, I have the matching shoes. <laughs> if you're watching. You're not in the back. I appreciate that support. <laughs> Well, I will see your matching shoe and raise you a classic <laughs> image of my man, Chuck <laughs> Cooper. He there always has the one of me. Every and, here's, and here's the thing, and, and Kwani, here there's a story. I mean, usually when we take the podcast, I'm in this room, but I'm mm -hmm. at a different angle. But Chuck mm -hmm. has been up on the wall for years. Yeah, I'm feeling the love. I appreciate it. it. I'm feeling the love. I really do. 
Hey, Kwani, I know you you were thinking the same thing a lot of people do when they come in, into, into this room, and they're like, wait a minute, number 11? Hmm. He don't look like Rajon Rondo. <laughs> I love that Rondo is the first person you, you mentioned. But, exactly. I mean, there's no reason why. There are so many people that have worn that number. But I'm going to just sip this tea. I don't have any tea. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'm going to sip that tea, and I'm going to take a big swig of that tea and say number 11 should be retired, and it ain't should be, and should not be Rondo. It should be the man. Considering all of the numbers that are in the rafters, too. Let's, let's point that out as well. There are so many numbers that are up there, so why not? Yeah. Like, like they can't have another number up there. Come on. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully you guys are speaking to the future. You know, we'd love to I see. Know. I hope so. Absolutely. And before we start really thinking about the future, let's talk about the past and how the past has affected the future. Future and I'm thinking really just about this being Black History Month and the impact that that your dad had had on so many. Uh, and think about him; they obviously think about him being the first Black player drafted. But there was a time when he was in high school where he was was thinking about not playing basketball anymore at all. I mean, take us through that that period of time, just from, from obviously your, the conversations, the research you've done on your father, and why was that such a pivotal moment for him? Well, a lot of this I found out, you know, we just recently released a Chuck Cooper story, Breaking Barriers, available on uh, Amazon, shameless plug. But, you know, when he was in high school, he he was asked to do the dirty work, rebound, you know, play defense. And uh, and he knew, you know, he had great scoring ability. So, uh, you know, he almost quit the team. But, you know, we're glad he didn't because, uh, you know, obviously the history he made. But he went on to win two city championships with his good friend who just got inducted to the National Football Hall of Fame, Bill Nunn, mm. and, um, and and went on to uh, to Duquesne and had a great career. And, you know, at Duquesne, you know, it was the same thing where, where, where you know, he was expected to rebound and play defense. But, you know, he finally got out of his shell and started to uh, score and became, you know, their first 1,000-point scorer. And ironically enough, still was getting uh, uh, talked about in the papers for not shooting enough. So go figure that one out. I, you know, when I, when I think about just that, that period of time in your father, I, I, I have a greater appreciation for patience, perseverance, and, and just recognizing when your moment to shine comes and making the most of it. Um, he understood better than most, I think, that just you can't just be a one-trick pony. Whether it's playing, whether it's off the court, you got to be well-rounded. And when I think about your dad, I mean, that's one of my takeaways. Because when I first came to Boston uh, about a decade ago, um, you, you hear about all the legends. Uh, mm -hmm. And I just remember conversation with you. Why weren't we talking more about this legend? I mean, like literally what he did for the Boston Celtics and the NBA cannot be replicated, duplicated or simulated as far as its impact. And I... I I kind of scratched my head that it, it took until 2019 before him to get into the Hall of Fame. But, you know, and again, that's just my own personal soapbox. That's just me speaking for the only three people that I, I know intimately, me, myself, and I. We appreciate all three. <laughs> there you go. Well, Sherrod, along those lines, you mentioned the off-the-court initiatives and the fact that nowadays NBA players, it's sort of looked down upon if you don't speak out against social injustices. But your dad was way ahead of his time, and he seemed to take it very – Seriously. So from what you've heard and talked about, what why do you think it was so important for him to platform social justice justice as much as he could? Yeah, well, you know, for, for my dad and, and and guys like Jackie Robinson and and you know the other two, I, I affectionately call them the first three, are uh, Earl Lloyd and Nat Sweetwater Clifton, credit those guys as well. You know, um they their big thing was they didn't want to really do anything to mess up the opportunity for anyone else coming up behind them. So, um, you know, they didn't, they led more by example. Uh, in my father's case, you know, uh, he, he developed some great friendships uh, on the team with guys like Bob Cousy. And, and, uh, and, you know, I guess through conversation, he realized that Cousy was making, a, a, you know, a lot more money than he was. And, and my dad, you know, a lot of people don't know this part of the story. You know, he, he made the all-rookie team uh, his first year. He was the 12th leading rebounder in the league. And, uh, you know, and he could play. So uh, when it was time to sign the contract, you know, he, he went to the owner, Walter Brown, and he, he, he really had a lot of respect for Walter Brown, called him Mr. Brown because of the stance he took in opening up the league. And it was a major financial risk that he also took, and we can get into that later. But, 
you know, he just really had a lot of uh, respect and appreciation for the organization. And uh, he took that stance. So he became the, the Celtics first contract holdout and uh, credit the organization who always treated my dad with dignity and respect. Um, you know, they, they came to terms. Right. And, and, and along those same lines, you know, your father understood the importance of respect. He understood that as good as I may be as a player, you need to respect me. And if you don't respect me, there are consequences. The consequences mean I ain't going to play for you. Uh, and, and so, and I, I think about players in this day and age, and I think about how, you know, people, you know, really kind of get on players for, for holding out for, for money and things like that. Without giving any thought to that, these players, this isn't like if you're a banker or if you are an accountant where you've got this unlimited shelf life for doing the job that you are good at. Exactly you right. don't have that as That's a pro exactly athlete. Right. And, and I, 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 I love the fact that, that your dad recognized in the moment, I just can't go along with just getting a check. I need to get a check with respect. Right. So. You know what, Sherrod, he, he did the same thing with the Globetrotters. Like he was on a contract with the Globetrotters and through the book, we found out that, you know, he was actually offered contracts by three NBA teams. And the Harlem Globetrotters after his junior year. But when he played with the Trotters, you know, he, he toured with them and he let the players know because he had played with Duquesne and they stole, stayed in decent hotels, right? But he let them know how they were being treated by the hotel, the roach infested hotels. Uh, you know, he was doing the math like the Globetrotters were selling out games. And he would go to the players and say, how much money did you make? How much money did you make? How many people you think were here? What was the price of the ticket? Uh, you know, something's not right here, you know? So he was just somebody who was conscious and intelligent and he had no problem, you know, uh, letting people know that, that he knew what was going on. Yeah, I, I, I think people sometimes lose sight of the fact that when they see these players and these multi-million dollar deals, you have to understand that the people cutting the checks make eight, nine, 10, 12, 15 times what these players are making. So Absolutely. if you if you want to hate on anyone about how just out right. of the bracket made the, co right. the economics of pro sports is, don't talk to the ones out there who, who giving you reason to be in the stands. Talk to the folks in the seats who are cutting them the checks. That's right. That's right. And, and they're not they're not risking injury, right? No. And, <laughs> and, and it goes back to what I was saying. It goes back to what I was saying about like accountants and bankers. If you're an owner, you don't have a shelf life or a, a, a statute of limitations on how much time you can spend making all that money. Yeah. But if you are an NBA player, you got on a great, great career, you might get 20 years in. On and, average, you're probably you're looking at three or four. Right. And, and I think that's why you have to, you know, there's good owners and bad owners. And you have to appreciate, you know, ownership. And, you know, my dad was lucky and, and blessed that he had he had a great owner who who made sure that uh, not only did, you know, he did come to terms and, and paid him fairly, but he was treated with dignity and respect. And, and I always like to point out, too, like, that's one of the major differences when you think about my father somebody like a Jackie Robinson who, you know, he got ostracized by his own teammates mm -hmm. on occasion. And in the Celtics organization, uh, Walter Brown, Red Arback, they made it very clear that you were going to treat Chuck Cooper with dignity and respect. Now, he did go say some of the teammates, some of his teammates would go on, go a little bit too far and want to talk about, you know, how, you know, some of their best friends were black growing up and that sort of thing. But they still treated him with dignity and respect. That's so important. It, it is. It is. I, I remember, and I, I think I shared this with you earlier, Chuck. I, I was talking with Kuzi a couple years ago, and somehow we got on the subject of, of your dad. And, and with Kuzi, here's the thing. He means well. Yeah. But every now and then, you know, he may steer in a direction that it will come out differently than what he feels or what the sentiment is intended to be. And so when he started talking about your dad, I'm thinking, like, Lord, please let this man get the words and his feelings aligned with each other. <laughs> So that I don't have to like really do a heavy yeah. edit on this. Yeah, right. exactly. Uh, and let's be real. We all got uncles, cousins, grandpas who kind of fall in that boat. Uh, mm -hmm. One day I'm going to be that dude. I know. So look, I can relate. So Cozy, he was telling me about when they were in Raleigh, North Carolina, and they were waiting around for, for a train to come. And, and they're doing what players even today do. Have a couple of adult beverages while you're waiting, you know, and, and so they're you know just kind of knocking a few back, you know, just doing what players do when they have a little bit of downtime, doing what our good friend Kwani Ludis was doing a few days ago for her birthday. Yes. Oh yes. Really <laughs> yes, I went. There. And so it gets to the point where, you know, they got to do what we all got to do. The body says, OK, you, you, you fill the tank up. We need to need to go to the bathroom. And then 
they see the sign that says for colored only. And then Red, you know, and Red was kind of getting emotional when he's talking about this. He was just like, I hated the fact that that I was I was white and there's nothing I can do about this. And it, you know, it, it hearing him retell the story was just painful. And and Red, and you know what the thing about the thing about Kuzi, and he was, he told me what they did was they went outside on the tracks, found <laughs> a little dark area. And let's just say they made a deposit to Mother Nature uh, <laughs> at that moment, and they got a good laugh about it. And, and so they figured out how to make the, the best of a just a really ugly situation. But it reminded me of the importance of allies, having mm -hmm. folks who actually have your back. And, you know, just again, and, and you're researching on your father's life. How important was that dynamic to him really getting some of the things done that he wanted to do? Well, so important, uh, you know, like that Kuzi story. You, you got to think about that. So he, here he is. They're 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 in North Carolina, and the game's over, and the team's ready to get to rest, and he couldn't stay at the hotel, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, so uh, you know, having a, a you know a, a good friend like Bob Kuzi that didn't let him carry that burden and 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 be upset by himself, you know, it was his ally, and and I'm sure he needed that that crutch and some support, but you know, anything that we do in life and, and he needed them, you know, after his basketball career where he went on and accomplished a lot of things, uh, uh, you know, he, he got his master's degree from the university of Minnesota after his NBA career and came back to Pittsburgh and continued to break barriers, became the first African American department director in the city of Pittsburgh, which came with death threats back in the early seventies. Mm -hmm. Um, and then went on to become, um, uh, uh, PM, Pittsburgh National Bank's so predecessor of PNC's first urban affairs officer, which was a position of any race that they created for him because of his unique skill set to really uh, build community and, and 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 be a coalition leader. So, and and that took allies. So I don't care who you are, what you do, what kind of work you do, you need to have support. And you know, as we think about you know the emphasis now, and I'm glad we're finally getting a lot of people to talk about the inequalities out here. You know, one, one thing I always say, listen, you know, black people, we can't fix racism. We can't fix inequality because we don't control the dollars. We don't we're not the ones that, that, are, that are being racist. So we need allies at every step of the game. We need we need CEOs of these corporations to step to the plate and start to hire uh, people in positions that can hire and lead teams or organizations. So at every step of the way, I don't care what it is, if you're really about supporting african americans and black people and trying to impact what's going on today we need ally allies at the highest level to make that possible absolutely I think, yeah. I think it's really important that we are talking about your father too because boston specifically i don't think the city and the team gets enough credit for integrating the nba when you look at the landscape of the city and the the they, even now you'll talk about free agency and like why don't nba players want to come here do you guys think that Boston doesn't get enough credit or there is still maybe enough, not enough work that has been done? I think the Celtics are starting to get the credit that they deserve. So when you think about it, they drafted my father, which, you know, Earl Lloyd's on record saying that he doesn't think he would have got drafted in the ninth round. My dad was the 13th overall pick. He was the second uh, consensus African-American, All-American in NC uh, college, MCAA college basketball history. Uh, so they drafted him. But he was already on the map. But then he became the first to actually start a game. Earl Lloyd played first the day before, but he came off the bench. So my, the Celtics started the first from, from, the, from the first game. His first game, day one, he started. He became the first uh, African-American to be named to all rookie team. He couldn't have done that if they didn't play him, right? Um, then they had the first black head coach, Bill Russell. And then they started the first all-black starting five. And if you go back into the 80s, they were one of the few coaches that had a black a black uh, from the few teams that had a black coach then. So uh, and then and then what they're doing now with uh, with the uh, Boston Celtics United initiative mm -hmm. where they're investing 25 million dollars into the community. So, you know what? I, I tell you what, you can't. Uh, I'm glad that my dad couldn't draft the Celtics, but I'm glad they drafted him. And, you know, we're still blessed and lucky to have a partnership with the with the organization and and to be a historically affiliated with the organization that did the right thing back then and doing the right thing now and i, I tell people a lot of times i say listen there's a reason why they have 17 uh world championships and you know sometimes when you make the right decisions when you do the right thing good things happen and they're a living example of that karma <laughs> you can be your friend or your foe Absolutely. it's all about what you know Absolutely. 
And yep. the, the, thing, the thing that I, I often, you know, have this is discussions slash arguments slash heated debates about uh, <laughs> is the distinction between the Boston Celtics and the city of Boston slash New England. And when mm -hmm. it comes to race, uh, because when you start looking at the receipts of the city and you start looking at the receipts of the, the Boston Celtics, very different story. And, and I, I tend to focus on what I'm familiar with, which is the team. And to, to Chuck, I mean, to your point, I mean, they have consistently be, been at the forefront of being innovative when it comes to race relations. They have been anything and everything. Now, are they perfect? Absolutely not. Can they be better? Absolutely. But the same can be said for many and, and frankly, most organizations, most teams, most individuals. I, I love the fact that the Celtics have consistently found a way to make an impact and they're doing it and not just because it was the right thing to do, but it's because it's something that they were moved to do, uh, that they felt even if there was going to push push back, they were going to push ahead anyway. Um, and just, I mean, full disclosure, were you surprised as much as I was that it took until 2019 for him to get into the hall? I wasn't surprised at all because we did a lot of the heavy lifting to get him there. You know, mm -hmm. he, he, had, he had been forgotten about. And, uh, you know, I, I'm someone who's always given back to the community and Back in the 90s, when Pittsburgh had a pretty bad gang problem, mm -hmm. uh, I started an after school program and, and brought some communities together. And I did that. And in, in the name of my dad, the Chuck Cooper Youth Development Association, we were had green and white uniforms. We had a basketball component, of course. Uh, and then recently, Duquesne University approached me about doing the Chuck Cooper Classic annual game. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, well, we'll do that. But I will never do anything in my father's name that doesn't have an educational component. Mm -hmm. And all that was really to continue to, you know, not only help young people, but to share the light on my father's legacy. And I remember, and I, I had to embarrass his university right now, but I remember the first Classic in 2009, they put a video package together and they called him Charles Tarzan Cooper, who's a Hall of Famer and a great, pro and is, you know, uh, was a great professional in his own right, but my dad's not Tarzan. <laughs> well, no. Uh, so, and then, and then when you would, when you would Google him, you know, back in 09, I mean, you, you really saw Tarzan Cooper, Tarzan Cooper. And if you Google him now, right, you see video, you know, you, you see so many assets, you see the hall of fame, you see his university just named their $50 million, uh, renovation, uh, to their, uh, a uh, basketball facility is now UPMC Cooper Fieldhouse. He's got another building on campus in his name, the Chuck Cooper building. Uh, the Converse Sneaks uh, that, that you have that I, I really appreciate, right? Uh, so, you know, now they're, you know, the, the, couple, the Converse recognize him. The Celtics have, you know, one thing I say about the Celtics, they have really begun to embrace that history and their role in it. So, uh, you know, his, his name is out there now and, you know, to have an opportunity to come on the A-list and talk about it and continue that momentum it's just a beautiful thing yeah. what was that process like of lobbying for your dad's history to really be known whether it's getting him into the hall of fame or just getting the recognition that we talk about him deserving just trying to get out in front of people and tell the story you know we 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 uh we went back we met, met with the nba um charlie rosenwagen kathy barons back in 2016 i believe and, you know, we told them the story and they said, listen, we love the history. And uh, and they committed to start to do some things to really get my father's name out there. And and, and that really changed the game. When we met with the NBA, uh, they started to, you know, drop some videos and put some information out there that, that I didn't have. Uh, so that really kind of began the national uh, recognition you know, start to roll in. So we, we always like to, we, and we got a great working relationship with the NBA and definitely thank them for, for making that move and helping us, uh, you know, really get his name out there and, and what he accomplished and what he, what he meant to the NBA. Yeah. Th th there's, there's, there's so much rich, rich history that, that your, your father in some way, shape or form was weaved into. Uh, but I want to just kind of jump back on something we touched on a little bit before about just the support that that he got from the Celtics when when he was here, and as your dad went, you know, through, played with other teams, he realized it ain't the same <laughs> everywhere in the NBA. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking vividly about you know his time with the Milwaukee, then Milwaukee Hawks, and how you know that there was they were playing a game down in Baton Rouge, and they 
the other team didn't want to play. And the coach of the Milwaukee Hawks said, okay, we're not going to, we're just not going to play him. And I'm thinking that wouldn't have happened if you would have been in Boston. And, and I know I, he realized that wouldn't have happened in Boston. Uh, it, it, the more I think about your dad, the more I, I, I love that symbiotic relationship between this just cause that he was fighting for and the fact that he had an organization that had his back, even in a location in a part of the country that didn't quite feel the same way about these type of issues as the Celtics as an organization did. Well, listen, you know, he's with the Celtics. They had some bench clearing brawls. If somebody called him out of his name, they 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 went at it a few times. So the Celtics really had his back, you know, even when it came down to, you know, physical altercations. But, uh, you know, in Milwaukee, the, the, the thing about it, he was actually for a short period of time before this happened. He was their leading scorer. Yeah. He was averaging 15 points a game. He was putting up over 20 on occasion. And they didn't score as much as they did. They do now, so those, right. those are some good numbers, right? Yeah, 15 but, uh, is like 23, 24 a game in, in this yeah, game. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. But, uh, yeah, they didn't support him, and and he let the coach know about it. It was Red Holtzman, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and they fell out. And, you know, before he knew it, he went from being the leading scorer uh, to on the bench and eventually, you know, off the team. Yeah, and, and, and that's the thing when I think about, you know, folks who are – Agents of change, the way the way your dad is. The, the concern that you always have for them is that somehow, some way, their time is going to be cut short. And when we look back upon history, we know why. It wasn't because they just forgot how to play. Yep, yep. <laughs> it wasn't because all of a sudden they just, you know, the game just passed them by. Yeah. You know, and I just – how do you as, – as, how do you reconcile that with yourself, uh, just knowing that – your dad's career probably had another five, maybe 10 years in him. Easy. Things that had nothing to do with his ability to play. Easy. Well, you know, it's, it's disappointing. Uh, but again, he was a man of principle. Uh, you know, he, he could have not said something to Red Holtzman and probably continued to lead them a score. But that's not how he was built. That's not who he, who he was. So, uh, and he, even, um, you know, with his job, when he became the first African-American city department director and city government history. He he was only in that position for one year because uh, not the mayor, but the mayor's chief of staff wouldn't let him run his department. Mm -hmm. So he said, I'm out. I'm not going to be a token. So I, I just really um, am glad that I got a chance to learn that lesson mm -hmm. and, and, and see his, uh, you know, his, uh, his drive and energy and, and, and his ability to, to persevere and keep pushing and through the foundation to be able to share that with young people. You know, to, to, to talk to them about the importance of education. You know, when he got his master's degree, there were only like 7% of degrees, master's degree earned by people of color or earned by uh, by, by African-Americans. It would even be less, um, you know. So he did that in a time that it was very rare. And he only did that so he could come back and, and make a difference and serve in the leadership role and the leadership position. So to be able to share that story and that legacy with young people, and help inspire and motivate them, you know, it really is a blessing. And, and I'm so glad I have the opportunity to do so. Yeah, you uh, you touched on the foundation and you mentioned that the book earlier. And, and Chuck, I wanted to make sure that you got time to just kind of let, let our listeners know a little bit more about just the Chuck Cooper Foundation, what you guys do, uh, how you service uh, different groups and, and, and just, you know, and, and give them an opportunity to definitely, you know, find out more about your father and the legacy that he's left behind that you're carrying on. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. So the foundation, Chuck Cooper Foundation, you know, we started by giving our graduate level scholarships because it tied into my dad's legacy. And and then we realized our, our students needed more. They needed to be connected to the Pittsburgh corporate community. Uh, so we started a leadership program and got them mentors uh, and, and connected them to some nice networks. And uh, and then, you know, so when I started the foundation, um, excuse me, mm -hmm. when I started the foundation, uh, I had I had just got laid off from the pharmaceutical industry to start to downsize. And, um, you know, it was a major sacrifice for me financially to do so. So um, so knowing that, you know, when, when we award our scholarships, you know, I, I tell my young people, listen, you don't just get the money, but I need you to go into the community and share your story of success mm -hmm. and help motivate some young people. We call it the Beacons of Light Outreach Program. So even though they get scholarship dollars, there is a, a community give back involved with that. So uh, so we've been able to reach a lot of people and, again, to be able to, to help motivate and educate young people, K through 12, 
uh, really young people of all ages uh, through my father's legacy, especially when, you know, anyone that wants to learn more about the book, you know, we released it last year in April, Chuck Cooper, uh, the break, uh, Breaking Barriers of Chuck Cooper Story. It's available on Amazon and it really takes you through his incredible life. You know, my my dad's father was the first African-American postal worker in Pittsburgh. And check this out. He scored. So and he was the one that both my grandparents were college educated. Right. Back in the late 1800s. Now that's rare, too. Right? That's so rare. rare. Yeah. <laughs> but but he scored so high on his civil service exam. Check this out. They made him come back and take it again with extra monitors. The second time around, he said he almost got a perfect score on it. But, you know, he's got an incredible leg. He got a brother, Cornell Cooper, who ran against Jesse Owens, but he was 15 years older than my dad. He was my dad's inspiration to get into sports. He was the by far the best athlete in our family, but because he was 15 years older, he didn't get a chance to play basketball or, or professional football. You know, it just wasn't an a, a opportunity for him. So it's a great family story, and, and I hope people uh, are interested in learning more about my dad and his accomplishments, and, and the book is available on Amazon. So thank you so much. All it's right. dripping with black excellence. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. What you got, Kwani? Actually, this has nothing to do with anything we talked about. I'm very curious, though, now, do you have an NBA team that you follow, and what is it? All Celtics all the way. So, okay, because you mentioned Pittsburgh a lot. Is he a Pennsylvania type NBA I, fan? But okay. <laughs> I, I never, I, I, I don't think I ever told this publicly. So when I was very young growing up, uh, I, I live in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, you know, one reason why I think my dad, you know, didn't really get notoriety too is because Pittsburgh doesn't have an NBA city. Okay. So once he retired and came home, you know, he didn't really have a connection uh, to the NBA except occasionally going to Boston for some events. But uh, so when I was young growing up, Pittsburgh didn't even carry the NBA game. So we would get like the championship series. Um, and so I, I would watch that with my dad. I played basketball. I got a high school gold medal hanging up back there. So I, I love the game. So so as motivation, you know, my dad would bet me. And he would he would take the Celtics. And back then it was almost the Celtics and the Lakers every year. And I would take the Lakers. And uh, he would bet me push-ups. And I used to have to do most of the push-ups. <laughs> And that's why you're a Celtics fan. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I said that's why you're a Celtics fan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what I'm saying. But so, but look, so as I got older and I began to understand the history, you know, I, I just love the Celtics organization. So I said when we had the Chuck Cooper Youth Development Association, you know, we had the green and white uniform. So it didn't take me long to realize, you know, uh, uh, who who to root for. Nice, like nice, perfect way to cap it off. Wow, yeah, Chuck <laughs> Cooper. President, CEO, and founder of the Chuck Cooper Foundation, Chuck Cooper the Third. Let me get it right, Chuck Cooper the Third. Uh, Chuck, thank you so much for your time man. and and sharing sharing stories about your father, who made just such an impact on the Celtics, on the NBA, on on so many so many people who don't even realize what he went through for them. Uh, to benefit and reap the benefits of those today. So thank you, Chuck, so much for your time. I appreciate it. Well, hey, thank you, you know, to, to get a chance to be on the A-List podcast. I know that we're doing something right, so I definitely appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Well, whoa, whoa. Hey, Kwani, nice shoes you got there. Thank you. I just need an excuse to show off my shoes once again. Well, this was a good time to, to, to show those particular shoes off. Those are the Chuck Cooper editions, I believe. I love how it came full circle. I brought these to go to an all-star game, wore them maybe twice. And then when you mentioned we're going to interview his son, I was like, wait a minute. We pulled these out the closet. And, Here we what's go. Even, and what's crazier is that the all-star game that we were at in Chicago, we found out son Chuck Cooper the third was there too. Yeah, he told us that he was there, which is crazy. I mean, that's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> This this was a great way to, to end Black History Month for, for us. I mean, to, to really kind of take a little deep dive into just the impact that Chuck Cooper uh, had on not just the Boston Celtics being the first black player drafted, uh, but also just the impact, the domino effect that he had, you know, where he was he was also the, the first holdout for the that the Celtics had uh, demanding f fair and equitable wages, which when you think about players today and, and just the negotiating dynamic of NBA players now, uh, Chuck Cooper in, in many ways was kind of the genesis of that. Uh, great discussion. Great discussion. Loved it. Loved it. Yeah. And I, I think that the fact that people like him are finally getting their flowers, it's wild to me that every year it feels like we're rediscovering or just finding out about someone that had such a big impact on something that we've known for years. So for us to hear a little bit more about his story, I really appreciated his son coming on and 
and giving us a little deep dive. But uh, of course, you got to get the book. You got to get the book. <laughs> got to check out the website. There's different opportunities to, to donate. I mean, it, look, they they obviously are like any like most nonprofits. They're looking to you know maximize opportunities for people to support them. But every dollar counts. Uh, right. Every cent counts. And then I, I've I've gone in there and taken a look. And yes, uh, I'm rolling with Chuck on this one, man. He, he's got a good thing going. I, I want to help him and support him any way I can. And I encourage our folks out there to do the same. Uh, I also encourage our folks to don't quite give up on the green team just yet. Right. Uh, it ain't looking pretty, but it could be worse. I'm really? Still, Wait, I'm still, really still have, it's hard for me to have hope for this team because the way they're playing is just, it's just bad on so many levels. Uh, you know, eight and three right out the gates. They've been anything but that good for the last month or so. I uh, haven't had back-to-back -back wins since like January 23rd, 24th or something like that. They got to be better. And they will it's be better. It's impressive how they've stayed consistently at 500. Like, is that an accomplishment maybe? Them hanging around that Mendoza line ain't pretty. They, they, need, they need to either raise up or, 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 or bow down. Uh, pick one. And I think they're going to raise up. I think they're going to get better. I think they're going to get rolling. And that's my story. And I'm going to stick to it today. But who are you? Bl are you blaming anyone for this? Oh, the whole team. Okay. Okay. I no, no one. I, I'm like Oprah Winfrey. You get a blame pie. You get a slice of blame pie. Everyone is getting some of this blame pie. There is no one that I believe should be getting a larger piece when you talk about Danny Ainge, you talk okay. about Brad Stevens, you talk yeah. about the players, all getting a nice help, help, heaping dose of blame pie. I mean, that's what a team is. Everyone is accountable, generally speaking. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, but, you know, we'll, like I said, they, they, they should be okay. I think they'll be okay. I'll also I'll also have some more content coming this week uh, from for uh, Boston Sports Journal. Just looking at the Celtics, uh, looking at you know some of those All Star results, and and also looking at you know some of their key players that we need to probably see a little bit more of uh, if they're going to turn this thing around. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I got a little bit of this, a little bit of that coming in. Quanti, I know you always got something coming on NBC. Yeah, I stay busy as well. <laughs> So the 10 questions with NBC 10 Boston, it's wrapping up the Black History Month version of it. We're still going to keep doing it next month as we have been doing in months before. But I'm talking to Seti Warren, the first black mayor to be elected. What city? In Mass he was of Newton, but in Massachusetts, actually, it's the, he was the first black mayor to be elected popularly. And then we have a WWE superstar star, Kofi Kingston. Both of them are Boston College alum. Ha. Uh, that's I wasn't going to mention that about SETI. Oh, of course. I had to mention it. Nope. So check that out, NBC10Boston.com slash 10 questions. Those should be really good interviews. And then next month, we have some more people coming down the pipeline as well. So stay tuned with that. Corny tap into that alumni base. Okay. You no. Know, you know, it's funny. My coworkers, they're like, so what did you do? Just like hit up the alumni network and say, can I have all the famous people? Which was honestly, it wasn't even planned like that. I just... Happened already have SETI, and then Kofi was like a whole other thing with WWE, and they gave me him as the availability. So that's a good idea. Yeah. And if you're looking for some Syracuse folks, I I, I got you covered. Nobody, nobody asked. That. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm not gonna burn that bridge because I might need it. <laughs> we, I could take care. I could hook you up. Okay. Okay. Maybe. I'll take maybe. <laughs> maybe. What y'all said? You good, Kwani? Yeah, I think we're good. We did another podcast. We're still here. Exactly. We're in double digits. We're in double digits. Shout out to all the real ones who have been listening from the beginning. Shout out to my mom. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But yeah, thank you guys for listening. This is great. We've gotten to another episode and I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to be here and I'm happy with the with the folks we're bringing on. I mean, this this was a great, I, I, I feel really good about this one. Uh, yeah. And then just having, you know, just the just the conversation that we have because yeah, we talk about the Celtics and that's and that's a big deal. But there's some things that are as big, if not bigger, than just wins, losses, whether Brad Stevens should be fired, whether you know this guy should be an All Star, all that stuff. Uh, and it's good to have those conversations from time to time. Uh, so I, I appreciate these these kind of kind of podcasts uh, that we're able to put out there for folks to give them a little bit more than just you know what to me is the conversations that everyone seems to be having, but exactly. frankly, we can give them a little bit more than just what everyone's doing. We give them what we do. Uh, right. And if you like this episode, share with a friend, like, subscribe, give us five-star reviews. That's all we ask. 
Exactly, exactly. And and, and quiet is kept. You know, Chuck didn't, didn't mention this, but his book, all they got are five star reviews on Amazon. That's mm. all they got. And okay. and, and I, I know this because I, I I was there. I put one in. There we and go. So, treat give us the Chuck Cooper treatment and give <laughs> us the five star ratings uh consistently, uh, which you have done, and we appreciate that. Uh, but listen, this was a great episode done again. Uh yes. For Kwani A. Lunas, A. Blakely, this is the A-List Podcast, and we are out. <laughs>